go through your mobiles and turn the sound off, please. Um, I'd like to welcome today Mark Harris, who is an artist and a writer, and also has a doctorate in philosophy. He's also currently the director of the School of Art in Cincinnati. His recent writing has been on Pipilotti Wrist and Marty Farquhar and Heather Phillips, but today his talk will focus on the aesthetics of, the, of LSD and countercultural um, ex experience. And Mark will also introduce some of his own work, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, so I, I was going to uh, frame, the, frame my talk. Uh, is this loud enough? Are you okay back there? Good. Uh, I wanted to frame my talk on uh, uh, proposing that we could consider uh, an LSD of, uh, an aesthetics of LSD trips in relation to art uh, and poetry from the 60s and early 70s. I wanted to frame that with, with two uh, brief uh, looks at, 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 at work that I've done myself. But I, I also want to issue a caution in that in speaking about a subject uh, such as uh, hallucinogens, it's not necessarily an advocacy of the, of the use of hallucinogens. And I, my, my own uh, uh, opinions of this should remain <coughs> private. I did give a talk once in Richmond at, at Virginia Commonwealth University and showed a piece that uh, I made around that time, which will actually be, will be at the Wellcome Institute in November, where I read uh, Benjamin and Baudelaire to cannabis plants. And after the talk, a student came up to me and offered to sell me some high quality hash. And I had to explain that this was uh, not, not really necessarily uh, um, an outcome of the talk. Um, I, I, uh, I, have, I have an interest in this field from a number of different perspectives. And uh, one of them <coughs> came to a head this summer when I did an exhibition in Cincinnati uh, of work that derived from images of American communes in the 60s. So I want to show you some uh, images from that exhibition and talk a little bit about how that work arose and what, uh, what the value of these uh, countercultural experiments, the communes, the communes were. <coughs> These, uh, the work I put in the exhibition, uh, in, it was two bodies of work, one involving paintings, like the one you see here, that, uh, that derived from images, uh, photographs, of artwork that hippies had done on the communes in the late 60s. That artwork was, was invariably a uh, poster pane of gouache on paper, a very ephemeral sort, and it was hard to know, also hard to decipher what the motivation for making the work might be or what its purpose might be, whether, whether it might record, uh, record a trip itself or be an aid to tripping, it was hard to tell. Uh, and the drawings that you see on the right are drawings from, uh, from the same photographs, but drawings of the, drawings of the commune residents themselves uh, in moments of, moments of relaxation, usually. The, um, the idea behind the paintings, one, 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 one idea behind the paintings was to, was to invite a, reconsider a reconsideration, a reevaluation of this vocabulary of psychedelia and the imagery that would, be, would have been an interest, of interest to these, uh, to these commune residents, uh, to reconsider it as something, in a sense, like a dream image or a wish image for a future that was not necessarily attainable at that time by the residents. Now, the notion of dream image, you, you might know from reading Walter Benjamin, and it is something that we could, that has been applied as an explanation for work originating in past cultures that we don't perhaps entirely understand the power of. Benjamin was applying it to architecture, particularly in the 19th century, uh, suggesting that, that um, qualities, visionary qualities, utopian qualities existed, resided in the architecture, uh, which were stifled in their own time and that it was our responsibility to go back and and bring these to life. Uh, Jameson has written about uh, Van Gogh's painting from a similar perspective. And I think it's, I think it's uh, a value to consider uh, psychedelia in, in a similar way. <clears throat> so these expired, these uh, lost images from the communes were ones that I wanted to elevate to uh, a quasi-heroic status. These are old paintings on linen, very large. And were, were derived from these, these particular photographs here. 
This is the book uh, that I was using. Um, there's a guy called Dick Fairfield who in uh, the late 70s published an alternative magazine uh, called The Modern Utopian, and, and three volumes are collected in this book. And I, I was really drawn to it, particularly because of the quality of the photographs, which are fairly amateur, and they must be photographs he either took himself or collected while he traveled. And also for the prose, in that he is uh, recording conversations he's had with commune residents and repeating them pretty much uh, um, unedited, or uh, extemporizing his own uh, uh, commentary about the communes. And he's extremely opinionated about their the quality of their welcoming, the quality of their, um, uh, uh, the, um, the values of their organizational structure. So it's a, it's a very different kind of book from either contemporary accounts that, that, that go back to the time, even by former commune residents, uh, or by some of the, uh, the more um, uh, uh, official or, 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 or mainstream publications that, 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 that existed at the time. And these are some of the, some of the drawings that uh, were made after those photographs that are really a representation of a page in the book, a part of a page of the book, including the narrative above or below the photograph. Uh, I, I put that drawing there because you can see the, the, the origin of the image for the painting, a poster for uh, a Midsummer's celebration. The titles for the paintings are all uh, taken from language on the page, pages in which they occur in the photographs. And the, the technique in the drawings, very simple pencil and paper, was and obviously very labor intensive, was uh, intended also to do, uh, to, to express a homage really for the, the labor uh, uh, of, of commitment by these uh, residents, these commune residents. It was a hard life for most of them. Uh, they were uh, building their own uh, structures and uh, wintering over in, in, in some of these remote areas, which was very difficult. So you're in the, the mountains of southern Colorado. And, and, and I think it's largely undervalued. The, 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 um, the, the, the classic view of the communes is that it was a, a moment in the counterculture that led to no measurable achievement. Uh, and I, I wanted to propose that this need not be the only interpretation, that significant achievements occurred in this, in, this, in, this, in this movement. And communes, and, and there are communes that exist, uh, that some of these communes exist uh, uh, to this day. Um, there, were, there were problems arising from uh, um, the ad hoc nature in which the communes were developed. This particular one, Morning Star, was founded by Lou Gottlieb, who was a, a successful folk musician in the early 60s. It was based on, on a free land concept in that a, a, a large tract of land was bought up and anyone who wanted to come and homestead it was welcome. But of course, uh, this only led to very inadequate sanitation uh, and, and, um, and, 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 and other, other utility provision and communes would be shut down by the authorities for that reason. And commune residents having idealistically, in this case and many others, set up a, a site and invited lots of people to visit, would find themselves visited at the weekend by three, two, three hundred people, all expecting to be fed. And, and then they, these, these visitors would return to the cities at the end of the weekend, so like tourists, really. Uh, so it became just impossible to sustain this kind of hospitality. And uh, I think like the Aztecs, or the Mayans were there, were there um, sites would, they would, the hippies would migrate to another, abandon one commune and migrate to one even more remote, uh, even more inaccessible in the hope that they would not be pursued. And so the, 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 uh, the welcome that, um, that Dick Fairfield received was very mixed because this is somebody who was documenting the communes and publishing information about them, even telling you how to get there. And this, this, was, um, this was not necessarily helpful uh, for, for, for them. Uh, it's, it's still a big movement in America. I, I recently met uh, an artist called Tom Holmes who uh, studied, uh, I mean, it, it shows perhaps the extent to which he's moved, but he studied with Mary Kelly at UCLA, moved to New York, exhibits with galleries in New York and, and, and Berlin, but has chosen to live on a, on a gay commune in, in Tennessee. Uh, and, uh, and under the, under the um, 
name for this particular organization of radical theories, which is F-A-E-R-I-E-S. And they live a, 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 a somewhat, you could call it, idyllic existence off the grid. No electricity, no uh, cell phone connection, no internet. And they will uh, themselves go out to work and bring money back. Uh, Libre, one of the communes that I represented in, in these drawings, uh, still exists and, and, is a, is a, um, and, and still models all its decisions on, on, on total agreement from all commune residents. It took them three meetings this last summer before they could decide where a well was going to be built. And if, you, if you're, uh, if you're a, a commune resident who, who built your structure in the commune, and in, in, even in the 60s, and decided to leave, you would... Um, you would forfeit any, any, any rights to, uh, to, uh, uh, to ownership. Uh, you have it, the, the land and all its dwellings are owned in, are owned in common. Uh, what, what, um, so why, why was, I think it's hard for us now in an era, uh, you know, a long <laughs> drawn out era of, of considering drugs as, as having primarily a recreational use to, to re, to reconsider the, the extent to which LSD in particular or other hallucinogens, peyote, mescaline, psilocybin were, were, were intended to have a political application primarily, I would say. Well, in, in a sense, the enjoyment as a social drug had its political application. And so why was this so? In what, in what, in what way was this so? Uh, in, in the... Uh, there, there are many, many instances, many ways in which we might try and understand this. But one is, one is I think, to, to, to try to imagine the kind of community that, 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 ex that faced, uh, and I'm talking here, I'm talking entirely actually about West Coast or Western states uh, counterculture, not East Coast really, and certainly not European. But to try to imagine the, the, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, um, Society that young people were, were growing up in in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, it was um, both from the perspective of the nuclear family and social structures uh, comparatively repressive uh, to what we enjoy today. And, and the, um, the importance of, uh, of all cultural forms that emerged in the 50s under beat culture, and we're talking also here about a transition from beat culture to uh, hippie counterculture, so from 50s to 60s, and there isn't a clear dividing line, I, I, I found, really, between the two. Uh, all, all cultural manifestations, including jazz music uh, and, and poetry, and uh, drug, drug use and writing about drugs uh, was intended to, to, to oppose that dominant, uh, those, 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 those dominant regulations that more or less predetermined how how uh, uh, kids would grow up, how they would associate, and what kinds of communities they might form, what kinds of families they might form as they grew older. One of the things that surprised me researching this material was how, uh, when we think of, 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 um, of, of drug consumption, and particularly LSD experiences as being a private individual, in a sense, essentially a selfish uh, indulgence, uh, is how much the, um, the use of these drugs was uh, envisaged as reconfiguring uh, uh, communities, reconfiguring families, even even the nuclear family, and and one of the one of the poets who I uh, corresponded with, and we'll see some of her work later on, uh, Bell Randall, uh, was was publishing poetry in the late 60s, early 70s. Had been um, turned on by her mother in 1964 when her mother went. Uh, this was when LSD was still legal. It became illegal in America in, towards the end of 1965. In 1964, Bell's mother went for uh, LSD therapy, which was an expensive, uh, um, uh, supervised therapy relating to uh, um, psych uh, um, psychologists, uh, psych uh, psych psych psychiatry. Bell's mother had failed, uh, she felt it, to, to find any successful treatment uh, for her um, uh, mental conditions, but in, in, in she paid a thousand dollars in 1964, which was a lot of money then, uh, and, and had and, and had this uh, and had LSD administer, administered to her under controlled circumstances, and was so uh, surprised at the outcome that she insisted that her daughter uh, 
who was, I think, about 17 years old then, undergo the same therapy immediately. And uh, so uh, Bell Randall was, was herself so transformed by the experience that she became an advocate for LSD uh, and, and joined, in fact, joined a church uh, as they existed then for the proselytizing of LSD consumption and, and also started to write poetry that obliquely referenced LSD. And so one, one very particular case that, that must stand for thousands of others uh, like that. But so a reconfiguration of the nuclear family, a reconsideration of, of, uh, of how the concept of community might be, might be uh, defined uh, because a lot of drugs were taken on the, on, on the continent. And some, like Drop City, one called Drop City, uh, were, were partially configured around or organized around the consumption of drugs. Uh, Hog Farm uh, was, a, a was a touring commune. Since they had a base in New Mexico, but they also toured with these vehicles and set up concerts, ad hoc concerts in the middle of nowhere and uh, distributed drugs, distributed LSD, uh, long after it was illegal. Uh, we, we'd have to, uh, and actually one, one quote here may help us to um, understand more about, I'll read it out because I realize it's very small. Um, this is uh, an artist, Diane de Prima, a West Coast artist, San Francisco based artist, explaining the, the fascination of a complete immersion, the desire to become completely immersed in, in, uh, in the consumption of drugs, in, in, in new sexual experiences, uh, in, in anything really that, that, that suggested avenues to new experiences. So she says, consciousness, expansion of consciousness itself was a good, and anything that took us outside, that gave us the dimensions of the box we were caught in, and an aerial view as it were, showed us the exact arrangement of the maze we were walking was a blessing, a small satori, because we knew we were caught, knew beyond a doubt we were at an, an impasse. Uh, so here these, these, these terms of box and maze help us to remember that sense of, of, of confinement and restriction that young people would have felt uh, in, in the 50s and 60s. If you want to um, re research this material, uh, you come across a certain problem. And when I started to, uh, when I started to look at this, I, I imagined that I would be dealing with material like this, that my, my information would be coming from a commercial cinema and from uh, first-hand accounts of acid trips. And over time, it, 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 it didn't at all. I, I ended up looking at experimental film, which we'll look at a bit later, and poetry primarily. <clears throat> but parallel to, the, uh, to the, um, uh, the, the experimental work that artists and poets were doing, the, the, um, the culture industry was, was, was rapidly uh, uh, keeping pace with those experiments with, with their own uh, commodities, largely B-movies intended for driving consumption. Uh, but there were, there were some, some of a certain quality and, and these are not, they're not entirely without interest. It, it's, they, are, they are curious artifacts. And it's, it's, um, it, it's, 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 it's extraordinary to see how, 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 um, how contorted and twisted and, and biased these representations can be to catch a wave of resentment against the counterculture. Um, there are some good ones amongst them, and I, 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 can, I particularly recommend the Monkeys film, Head, which is really worth seeing. Uh, and of course, Roger, 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 Roger Corman's film, The Trip, is famous. Uh, and as, as a film of certain quality. But some emerge in this period as being well worth looking at uh, for moments in the films rather than perhaps the entire film. Chapaqua, uh, Conrad Rook's film, the Top Left, is a, is a remarkable document and one that that's really straddles beat and hippie culture. Uh, Conrad Rooks was a, um, from a wealthy family and was able to finance this film entirely, entirely himself. Um, it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a documentation, a documentation, it's a, a recreation of his own drug experiences in North America and his treatment in a Swiss clinic uh, for, for those addictions and he was taking everything. And it includes a lot of very uh, celebrated figures of the counterculture, uh, Anne Ginsberg, William Burroughs and many others. Uh, the Fugs, uh, uh, an important <coughs> band from the 60s are playing in one of the one of the most remarkable I think, 
uh, early sequences, uh, depictions of, um, of drug influence, rock and roll. Uh, and then Easy Rider, I'm sure most of you will know this, know this film, um, but may not know that Bruce Connor, the, the West Coast artist, was an advisor uh, to, to Dennis Hopper. They were friends, and, 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 uh, and Hopper brought uh, Connor in as an advisor, particularly to the sequence we'll see in a minute, uh, the, the, the LSD sequence filmed in the cemetery in New Orleans. Uh, Barbara Schroeder's film, Moore, filmed in Ibiza, uh, also worth looking at, and, and performance, of course, uh, perhaps uh, a, very, a very strong movie um, uh, has a couple of sequences that are relevant to what we're talking about and we'll look at those but these films come out at the end of the 60s and they in all cases I would say even uh, well Ch Chapaco is the most subtle really but in all cases they, they depict um, the, the, um, the 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 uh, the reaction against the ebullience of the mid-60s. This is the, this is the, the downer period. Uh, this is the, the end of the ride, really, for, for, um, for, for, um, uh, for, 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 for all that experimentation and optimism. So all of these, all these films end, end tragically and badly and, 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 and have, to be t have to be understood from that, from that perspective. But I would say Chapacqua is the one which I think uh, unam 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 unambiguously represents the, um, the value and, and predicament of, of serious uh, drug use. And on the, other si on the side of the poetry, some examples of the massive amount of, of, of literature coming out of, out of, out of beat and, 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 and uh, hippie counterculture writers. Uh, in, in this case, um, and we'll look at some of these poems, but the ones that I, I want to particularly look at are, are these two on the bottom right, uh, Tom Gunn, who was actually uh, British and moved to America, and Val Randall, who was initially Tom Gunn's student and then became a friend um, and turned, in her, in her uh, turn, turned Tom Gunn on to LSD. Um, Ed, Ed, Ed Dawn, <coughs> a very interesting uh, book-long poem uh, called, called Slinger, uh, coming out in, in the early, very early 70s and, uh, and, and revisiting in its, in its way, revisiting many of the early 60s initiatives around, um, around uh, uh, drug use, looking at them critically uh, rather than celebratorily. I, I'd like to show this Easy Rider clip because, well, probably because Connor worked on it and, and, he, and we'll look at some of his material later on. Although we need sound.
on for some, some, while, some while longer. The, the, the two actresses I want to make a note of, Karen Black uh, and Tony Basil. Tony Basil uh, was an amazing dancer and became a, a successful um, singer in the late, so pop, pop singer in the late 70s, early 80s. But she, uh, Bruce Connor, um, made a film of her dancing. Um, I might remember the name of it in a bit, but uh, a lot of Bruce Connor, a certain amount of Bruce Connor's material is, is traceable online, but increasingly hard because these estates of these artists are pulling the material offline. Uh, um, more, a short clip from this. I, I, I include this really uh, because there's a very unusual sequence, short sequence in the middle of close-ups of, of uh, natural objects uh, and, 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 uh, and a flower, which is, is something that was, was clearly pioneered in other, in earlier experimental <coughs> film. <coughs> and we'll see the similar thing in performance. short clip from performance. The energy is pulsating into the vocus. The flare.
so there's a challenge facing filmmakers who want to integrate uh, what would be a, um, a representation of LSD experience within the narrative structure. How do you do that? And so that, that to some extent, explains this sudden break between uh, conventional uh, um, narrative filmmaking and this, these close-ups that are used in both performance and more. Uh, where the experimental film ex that we'll look at, where the experimental film look, does not have, does not require a narrative structure, uh, those, those um, uh, uh, problems don't, don't occur and, 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 a, and a much more complex filmic structure is possible. Uh, I would just like to leave this for one second, but two, the two writers who are very, were very important, uh, not really now very widely read, but Alan Watts and Timothy Leary in the late 50s and early 60s. And uh, Alan Watts primarily wrote on, on Zen, Zen Buddhism, but did experiment with LSD and did write about uh, his experiences. Leary uh, was initially an academic at Harvard uh, who who was fired from his job uh, because of his open proselytizing of LSD and, uh, and, his, and his claims that it had to be, it should be a subject, it should be a, a, a formal subject that enjoyed uh, being taken seriously in the academy and should be something that, that students and, and faculty could experiment with in the academy. But Alan, Alan Watts, uh, writing in 1958, in, uh, in um, an essay that he called The New Alchemy, which gives some indication of how he was thinking, described uh, the, the um, importance of, of, uh, of LSD for changing the way, or offering a, a way of reimagining uh, what he called habitual patterns in everyday life. Uh, his, he was concerned both in his evaluation of Zen and his evaluation of LSD to show ways in which uh, this structure, this maze, if you like, or this uh, habitual patterning could be, uh, could be challenged, could be shifted. And one of the terms he came up with this process was uh, love play, uh, hyphenated love play, um, which he, by which he meant um, an engagement with the world that recognized the full extent of our emotions and affections with uh, phenomena in the world and something that, uh, an attitude or an emotion that dissolved uh, the boundaries between the world of independent organisms and the world of our consciousness. And that I think is, is one reason you, 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 we, we, uh, we're faced in those commercial films by these, um, this, 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 this transition between acting, active dialogue and immersion in, in, uh, in natural objects. But what's uh, wrote about a trip he undertook, and, uh, and I think this description may help us understand um, the impact that the, that the drug had in its relationship to his notion of love play. He writes, "Looking up, I saw that the stars were trans uh, the stars were colored with the same reds, greens, and blues that one sees in iridescent glass. At the same time, the trees, shrubs, and flowers seem to be living jewelry." inwardly luminous like intricate structures of jade, alabaster or coral, and yet breathing and flowing with the same life that was in me. Every plant became a kind of musical utterance, a play of variations on a theme, repeated from the main branches through the stalks and twigs to the leaves, the veins in the leaves, and to the fine capillary network between the veins. Each new bursting of growth from a center repeated or amplified the basic design with increasing complexity or delight, finally exulting in a flower. Um, both Watts and Leary were extremely widely read and uh, had the, a very high status in, in, in the counterculture communities. Uh, Leary was involved in publishing a magazine called The Psychedelic Review that first came out in 1963 that openly uh, uh, advocated LSD use and, and tried to determine um, scientific evaluations for the effects of the drug, both in, his, both in, his, both in historical applications and in, in, in terms of their value for present day society. And, uh, and he, he was, um, besides the Psychedelic Review, which, which I, uh, its final issue, in fact, is very different from its earlier issues. The final issue uh, came um, after Leary had to, uh, after Leary was arrested for a very, actually, uh, 
a very small amount of drug possession and was facing an extended prison charge. And he, he fled the authorities. He fled with the assistance of the weathermen. If you don't know the weathermen, they were uh, um, America's last uh, homegrown terrorist group who were advocating bringing the war home, uh, bringing the Vietnam War home by setting off explosions in American cities. They, they um, uh, helped Leary escape from prison and, and helped him get to Mexico. And the final issue of the psychedelic review, just to show you how far uh, this came and just how negative this, this, um, uh, this, this um, uh, extolling of drug use came, advocated, in fact, violence uh, against the police, and violence against the authorities, which was completely different from anything that Leary had been uh, interested in before. But around about 1965, Leary himself writes uh, about um, a concept called re-imprinting. This would be something, it's, diff it's different from what's love play, but re-imprinting uh, is his term for the, um, uh, the experience of, of exiting from an LSD trip, uh, LSD having freed you from prior imprinting the, um, the social, uh, uh, um, social structures in, in which we have inherited and grown up with need to be shaken off, radically shaken off, and, and, and so new, uh, exposed to new visions, new understanding of our place in the world, we can, we can uh, become re-imprinted and we enter, uh, uh, enter the, um, the, the, uh, the unintoxicated world. Uh, so Leary writes, an exciting and frightening aspect of psychedelic drugs is just this, that these compounds not only temporarily suspend old imprints, they produce new imprints. During a psychedelic session, the nervous system, stripped of all previous learning and identity, is completely open to a stimulation. And here is the joy, the discovery, the revelation. In that same essay, he cites the importance of, of a psychedelic art, uh, which, um, perhaps not consistently, he, he, he involves John Cage and Bruce Connor uh, and, and William Burroughs in that, in that, in that uh, constellation of, of uh, a radical artist who may, who may be able to carry forward a, um, a kind of changes that he advocates. Um, but the poets themselves, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, writing explicitly about L L LSD use, and it's hard to know what to do with poems, but perhaps we should just read them out. And the, the structure on, on the the page, which I've tried to reproduce here, the structure on the original page, relates obviously formally to the experience that he's describing, but also to the fact that he's ingested the LSD and is coming in, is landing in a plane, uh, landing in an airplane. Intolerable arabesques coming and coming and coming, on and on, toward me, onto me, over me, relentless, ineffable, coming down now, re-echoing, gliding down those landscapes and arabesques of earth, seas re-glitterized, seen through a silkscreen overlay, sun-stricken. And uh, Michael McClure, a, a very important beat poet who frequently wrote about his experiences with hallucinogens, is, is particularly interesting because he was not afraid to write both about the good trips and the bad trips. And here you have examples of two so uh, two experiences of peyote, very close to one another. 1959, the first one, a good one. There is a golden bed radiating all light. The air is full of silver hangings and sheaths. I smile to myself. I know all there is to know. I see all there is to feel. And then two years later, in a poem called Lines from a Peyote Depression, and I can't go on or go on that this is not a mood, but the way that matter is and love. And I don't know what to say from here. There are stars far away and cold, to eyes so hot we measure them in space and cold. Cold, 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 and far away. So the bleakness of that second vision is, um, uh, is, is, the, is, the, um, is a frequent enough experience in some of these accounts, but not all poets engage with it, not all artists engage with it. So to look at Wallace Berman uh, for a little bit, Wallace Berman is an interesting artist to consider from, from also from the, the, the perspective of, of, of East Coast art, an art more engaged with commercial exposure. 
uh, Berman uh, decided really not to have anything to do with, with, uh, with was minimally engaged with the gallery system. And, and also, uh, I think as this photograph shows, prioritized his family at the center of all his work uh, and, 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 and activities. And we, and nowadays, we, 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 we place a high value actually on his son's accounts of Berman's uh, experiences with drugs and, and the function his art played in his life. These are self-portraits of, of Berman's, a, a very a gifted photographer, but someone who was very early on uh, prosecuted for obscenity uh, in this exhibition. And this may be an indication of just how repressive the times were, but there was a drawing uh, behind one of these hanging pieces, a small drawing, uh, rather like what we might imagine now would be a manga representation of two figures looking barely human having sex. And this was offensive enough for the authorities to shut down the show and to take Berman to court. But again, uh, just to point out in one of, the, one of the images here, and this is Berman going to court, in one of the images here, again, on a gallery invitation for a show of his in Los Angeles, he's holding his son. And I think this is a really remarkable, uh, uh, remarkable um, phenomenon of the time in this, uh, exactly where we, where we expect and even uh, in the way that, that, that the sixties has been disqualified uh, as, as a self-indulgent uh, um, uh, uh, pursuit of, 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 of private interests we see uh, the elevation of, of, of families to center stage. Not entirely. There are certainly uh, issues that I think the children who grew up on communes have uh, with the treatment they receive, the, 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 the partial education they receive, and the neglect they receive. And I think that's a, a largely unwritten history of, of communes that will certainly come out, having spoken to some former commune residents who were children in the 60s, just how difficult their life uh, the lives were, often, often were. Uh, Berman had his own gallery. Uh, this was a gallery that had no roof, and it was on a former houseboat, and, and the shows lasted for one day. Um, but he's, he's particularly important, I think, for Seminar. Seminar was a, uh, a, a publication edition in very small numbers, and uh, Berman made his art rather than for a large audience, I would say for a group of intimates or people who he wanted to get to know. A uh, seminar came out, I think, in just nine issues and uh, was really a, a collection of, of individual um, artworks uh, combined into a, uh, a, a multiple and distributed amongst friends. Uh, initially, I think it was 150 issues and then may not have ex ever exceeded 300. Um, the content frequently addressed drug use, but also uh, it was hard, it's hard really to predict uh, the, the extent of imagery of some of the, of some of the issues. Uh, the, the, the issue up here, um, Seminar 3, uh, is only, it only contains a poem by Michael McClure. And uh, issue, sem is, issue Seminar 9, is only a single page, uh, a single page um, uh, production that, again, with a poem by Michael McClure, but addressing the Kennedy assassination. Um, Berman's own attitude to, to drugs was, was very uh, interesting, and again, not something you would normally expect from necessarily from a, an advocate of hallucinogens and uh, marijuana. And here, a poem he, he writes under the pseudonym of Pantos Antos in, in Sem from Seminar 4. And it's a list, really. So morphine mother, heroin mother, Yage mother, benzedrine mother, peyote mother, marijuana mother, cocaine mother, and so on. He, he's keen not really to, not to discriminate against uh, particular users. However, uh, he, he was, uh, he had many friends who took heroin, and, and he was, uh, would sometimes uh, insist that they not do heroin in his house, but he he was critical of heroin use because he said it impeded creativity rather than any for any other reason. He felt that it was a, a it was essentially a nihilistic drug, but uh, hallucinogens and, and and marijuana he felt were extremely positive for creativity. 
but it didn't stop him representing heroin in the seminar and in his uh, film. So here is um, Philip Le Manche, a poet, um, uh, shown shooting up in, in, in another issue of seminar. And this is the, uh, this is the final issue which uh, all, all, all Berman has done to alter this, modify this famous photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot by Jack Ruby is to double the federal agent that is leading um, Lee Harvey Oswald, which some might interpret as, as, a, as a comment or an indication on, on just the obfuscation that surrounded the assassination, just how difficult it became immediately to know anything about what had really gone on in that time. And then a poem uh, here that McClure wrote. That's all this issue contained. And I understand, I think this has been reprinted, actually, by Bookworks in some form here in London, but otherwise unobtainable. So let's look at a bit of Aleph, which is the only film that Berman made. Um, this is a silent film, and it took years to make. It, it, it has some form of structure, but I would be reluctant to, 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 to attempt to describe what that is. But it does begin and end with a figure shooting up John Alexander, another artist and poet, uh, is seen shooting up at the start and end of the film. And we'll just watch a few minutes of this. It's, it's characterized, I would say, and, and, here, we, and here we enter perhaps, uh, we, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll be reminded of the commercial cinema representations we were looking at. But here also Berman has been, applies Letraset directly to the film. He's painting on the film. He's recycling images over and over again so it becomes like a kind of orchestration, an orchestrated film. It's, it's not linear. And as I say, it's silent. You'll see in the middle of this, uh, right now, we have, uh, so it's framed by scenes of John Alexander shooting up, but here in the center we have the, um, you know, this view of cannabis, um, marijuana being weighed and sorted. And from time to time, as here, images of Berman's own work. I'm going to jump over these poems by Robert Creeley and Philip Whalen, uh, the two, two other poets, like so many, who, who wrote about LSD. Allen Ginsberg, I think, wrote, uh, well, wrote frequently about many drugs that he took, and, and, and unfortunately for him, invariably had um, troubled experiences with hallucinogens, uh, but nevertheless wrote some of the richest accounts of the uh, Richest, richest accounts you can find of experiences, um, really worth really worth looking at. And, and some of his his first account, Ginsburg's first account, was written uh, about a peyote experience in his parents' home in New Jersey, Passaic, New Jersey, uh, surrounded by his family, uh, suburban events, and and it's as if again this is somebody saying, look, this, these these need to be understood in 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 the domestic everyday context. There is nothing necessarily exceptional about these. Um, they, the family can center around uh, the use of the drug. Uh, Bruce Connor, uh, a man who, an artist who, who didn't like being represented, he didn't, wasn't comfortable with his, his portrait being taken, and when, on the occasion he did allow it, a few occasions he did allow it, here he, he imagines himself being portrayed as a kind of superstar artist, as a joke. And here again is Tony Basil, uh, seen in the foreground here with, with, um, uh, with other um, women posing as if they were 
um, groupies or uh, friendly with, with uh, um, De uh, Dennis Hopper, this is uh, Bruce Connor, that is Dennis Hopper. And they, they collaborated in some form on an exhibition uh, which um, Connor called the Dennis Hopper one-man show, but it was entirely of Bruce Connor's own work. These are other self-portraits of Connor's which give some, some idea of the, the, um, uh, the ambivalence he felt towards self-representation. And this is a very interesting artist who, who uh, was so, um, so affected in, in the, in the um, 50s by, the, by the, um, the Cold War and the imminence of, of nuclear, um, nuclear catastrophe that he moved his family to Mexico uh, away from American urban centers and tried to survive in Mexico, managed for about a year, and made works like this in Mexico, which are extraordinarily uh, rich artifacts, visually, textually rich artifacts but eventually came back to North America. Again, another piece from Mexico. But also made these extraordinarily strange uh, drawings whose mandala forms repeat uh, a, um, an, an, uh, an image form that was very popular in the period, of course. But they're also extremely labor intensive. So here is a, is a piece. I'm sorry, I apologize for the photograph. It's not, it doesn't have that big shadow uh, section on the right. This is one where the dots are created by drawing around the dot. So the page is gradually filled with black, allowing the, the, um, the constellation to stand. And also these little known Rorschach drawings where the paper is folded uh, successively to create uh, an agglomeration of Rorschach images. But we're going to look at, at, at two brief moments from two versions of Looking for Mushrooms a rare and hard to find film of, of, this should not say Wallace Berman, this should say Bruce Connor. And um, this is, uh, is um, one of many films he made. Bruce Connor is known for uh, using found footage, uh, mostly by B-movie B producers. He made films on the, uh, he became deeply moved, deeply troubled by the Kennedy assassination, made two films about the assassination. But here he's looking for mushrooms. Again, in this version, a silent film, uh, silent version, very short, it's only about four minutes long. The first part of it filmed in Mexico, and then the second part, actually it's in reverse chronological, the second part was filmed earlier, it was filmed in San Francisco. And here I would say the rapid edit, the, uh, the, the um, profusion of imagery uh, is is an, is, is an attempt to characterize or to represent the, the state of hallucinations under, under, under magic mushrooms of peyote. Um, Connor set this, made many versions of this, and we, we'd have to understand, uh, although we would view this as a silent film now, uh, uh, um, it, was, it was also uh, designed to be shown in, 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 as part of light shows with, with rock bands playing, uh, he's somebody that committed at least a year of his life to, to participating in, in what would be the club culture of the time in uh, designing material to be projected. So there's that brief moment of, 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 of mushrooms. Um, and, uh, and he made two further versions of this. Uh, essentially, the footage is the same, but he set one to the Beatles track, Tomorrow Never Knows, psychedelic uh, piece of music, and then uh, much later in 98, this version, which is, uh, uses a 1968 Terry Riley composition. And now we're looking at the end of the film. But you can see how much the impression which of the material would change according to its uh, musical accompaniment. This is also a slightly slower version than the, the first one I showed you. And that for every frame of the first version, there are five frames to this version. Each frame is repeated five times. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to, uh, since Tom Gunn was so explicit in, in his references to LSD, I'd, I'd like to read a couple of uh, sections of poems by him. Um, now, he's, the quote on the bottom right here is, is him retrospectively describing his time in the late 70s, and he writes, these were the fullest years of my life, crowded with discovery, both inner and outer, as we move between ecstasy and understanding. And up here, uh, from a poem called At the Center, and this is a, 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 very, a great book, uh, from a great book, a collection of poems called Moly. What is this steady outpouring that, oh wonder, the blue line bleeds and on the gold one draws, currents of image widen, braid, and blend, pouring in cascade over me and under to one all river, fleet it does not pause, the sinewy flux pours without start or end. The repetition of pause in two, in two, in two senses of the word, and the, particularly the use of braid, which he, he felt was um, a perfect choice to describe this interweaving of experiences that uh, one would encounter under LSD. And this again, he explicitly uh, footnotes this LSD Folsom Street. And another poem, LSD San Rafael Woods Renaissance Fair. Bell Randall, on the other hand, is more oblique in her representations. And in this particular poem, uh, from her only published book until, I don't know, until, the eight, uh, until the 90s, I think, 101 Different Ways of Playing Solitaire, uh, talks about the impact, I would say, of, of an urban setting rather than a rural setting or private setting. What, what is it to be under the influence of LSD out in the city? Um, and this uh, short section from a, a marvelous part of the, the long poem, 100 ways, different, 100, 101 Different Ways of Playing Solitaire. She writes, and Genesis occurs, the mysteries of creation sift and tumble past me in a blurred profusion on the papered walls, dwindle and resolve themselves in scattered, gleaming stars. So this imagery that you see in the, that you hear in the poems reminds us of what we're seeing in the films. And we, 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 I would invite you to consider these representations as being two parts of one entire culture of of celebration of, 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 of the use of hallucinogens. An important film from this period uh, was Ben Van Nieter's uh, San Francisco SF Trips Festival. This was the last of the Ken Kesey experiments. Ken Kesey and the uh, uh, magic pranksters drove a bus around, rather like the one you saw in the Hog Farm drawing, drove it across the country and back uh, to San Francisco, and then set up these parties before the um, criminalization of LSD where uh, the drug actually manufactured in, in a very pure form was, was distributed freely um, to crowds of people. And this was the last instance where that was possible. And Ben Van Meter films this over three nights, the SF Trips Festival ran for three nights. And what he's doing is he's running a 100-foot spool of film three times. So you're seeing three layers of footage uh, throughout. And the soundtrack must be some ambient recording uh, um, that he, that he uh, filmed on the night. When, uh, when Van Meter uh, spoke about this film at a conference uh, recently, he described his position as the filmmaker, as the cameraman, as, as trying to represent uh, the LSD experience as being one where there's no way of evaluating where 
the cameraman begins and the filmed event, uh, the cameraman ends and the filmed event begins, as if the two are parts of, 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 uh, are parts of one uh, utterly intertwined uh, of entity. occasion of a film of a light show included as part of an experimental film. And then in the last few minutes, uh, leaving the uh, culture of LSD behind, I want to conclude with uh, just a brief look at some other work of mine. Uh, I, have, I have for a long time been interested in, in socialist literature and utopian communities, and that's obviously what took me to the communes in the first place. But I, I went to, uh, I was fortunate enough to spend two months in Beijing a few years ago, and I filmed, uh, I was so impressed by the amount of music in the city that I filmed um, musicians performing, and I asked them in, in turn to, to sing one of a choice of Mao's poems that Mao had written on the Long March, 1934, uh, 1934, uh, the Long March being the, um, the this, uh, as, as represented retrospective, the heroic incident that saved the Communist Party as they fled the nationalist forces. About 100,000 people set out, I think, uh, well, from different locations in the south of China, set out on the march, and only 4,000 survived. So it wasn't really a heroic event, but it did. Mao survived, and other, as did other leaders, that they were able to regroup and reform and, and, and expand. But it was very hard to know what the, uh, what the, um, uh, position of Mao was in contemporary China. And, and so one reason for asking musicians to sing these poems was to just try to encourage some reflection on, on Mao's legacy. So a few, a couple, and this was a, maybe the, the film clips that resulted in the end were some 20, 21 clips. So here are a, a small number of them which will give you an idea of the range of, of performances. <laughs> I think that's maps over a, a famous pop song by Christine Aguilera, I think. Uh, so uh, the, um, the musicians are not given any time 
uh, much of any time to, to rehearse. So, uh, but it, was, it ended up being a, a very uh, unconventional portrait of communities in Beijing. And I returned the following year to put on a rock concert uh, of six Chinese bands. There won't be time to look at this, but one of the, 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 the musicians was hardest to engage in that earlier project were contemporary musicians. Uh, so returning a year later to put on a concert under the rubric of utopian bands was a way of inviting uh, evaluation or consideration of these musician groups, so they call themselves the musical underground, uh, to, 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 to be recognized as a, as a socialist community, uh, as an ad hoc socialist community of their own kind, perhaps realizing uh, ideals that had not been uh, fully realized on a national level by Mao uh, uh, earlier. So I, I'm going to finish there and give you a chance to ask some questions if you wish. Yes. And how could you uh, share um, uh, the last time the last film? Uh, SF Trips Festival, yeah. Ben Van Meter. Well, well um, I, 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 um, I haven't looked. I haven't look worked from the. I haven't looked from the perspective of trying to, let's say, separate out representations of that kind from drug use. I think I think drug use was so pervasive at the time, so celebrated that uh, you know, there's even even uh, attempts by. Uh, uh, and, and a current New York writer to link it to the experience of minimalism, and so as if saying to say that minimal art would not have existed but for, but for uh, hallucinogens. So with that, we'll see how that thesis develops in his work. But but uh, Brackish is an interesting case, and, and of course, no, no film, no, probably no filmmaker compares with him in 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 in, in, the, in the sense of manipulating the material. And, and we could say, we, and Brackage, although he, he did not live on West or East Coast, he lived in, in, in the mountains in Colorado, uh, w w did frequently visit colleagues on East and West Coast. And Brackage comments on, on Wallace Berman's film, Aleph, as being a key document, critical document of the counterculture. And, and, uh, and, and Brackage assisted filmmakers in the processing of their work. But he himself regularly denied that his work had a connection to LSD. So he is, he is somebody who would, who would separate his work out from that form of representation, would say that. But perhaps this is also a way in which, a way in which an artist or filmmaker would, would carve out, uh, would carve out a, a, a position for themselves, so as to be differentiated from what's going on around them. But I think the film he did uh, called I Myth is a nine-second film that is a remarkable film, uh, which is for me the closest to an LSD representation of all his work, that he would probably say again that it isn't. Someone from his work, the idea is not a representation of such, but it's actually the duration or aspect of his work. Yeah. Which is quite close to a dream as well. Yes. I think I think the I think the not 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 explicitly in in the way that Geisen did. I think Geisen is unusual. Uh, it, it's I I think um, I think the immersive immersive sensory environment of the of the parties 
uh, with or without the drugs were, in, were, were envisaged in, in those lines, that you didn't need to be, uh, you didn't need to take LSD in order to uh, experience the transformation that this being bombarded by visual stimuli offered you, for example, in SF trips first of all. But it would, it would be hard, it would be hard to make the claim for, for those events as being something separate from a, a drug experience. And when I look at the when I look at the psychedelic posters that are famously famously represent uh, uh, the the um, visions of that period, I, I, again I I I, I think you, you could argue that, that those representations, largely coming out of largely coming out of San Francisco in the late 60s, mid, mid to late 60s, are emblematic of the kind of music that they advertise, uh, rather than a rather than a drug experience. And certainly the way that musicians envisaged their work, uh, I, I, I would say you, 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 you could plausibly claim that that again um, was, to, was to trigger the trance-like states or, that, that were with or without drugs. Yeah. The current film. No, I haven't. No. I'll definitely um, check it out. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question, and I think since for many people uh, the. Um, Experience of the drug has was transformative and probably continues to be transformative in in in, in suggesting the artificiality of these of these barriers between yourself and yourself and, extern, and, an, and an, extern, an external world. Yes, it's 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 certainly true. I, 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 in some way, the poems the poems have to be taken as advocating or uh, um, as advocating the experience. So in that sense, it's it's hard, it's harder to um, you know, perhaps one's understanding or appreciation of the poem is partial if you have not also experienced the drug. But I would say these are, in any case, exceptional poems and and are, and are not uh, are not confined by their by their representations. And that's certainly a position that Bell Randall understood. She was she felt that it was not necessary to to write about. Uh, to write explicitly about LSD in order to write about the kinds of experience that the kinds of experiences that that LSD, amongst many other activities, uh, um, opened up to you. So she she deliberately chose not to uh, not to reference the drug in order to in order to in order to um, in order not to not to attract a biased in, a biased interpretation of her poetry. That's it.